how's your journey been with epilepsy so far? So it's so like we were just saying, like, it's, it's so wild to rehash out because I, it's been so long and you block a lot of that traumatic time of your life out because it is truly traumatic especially when you're young so I okay so from the beginning I guess I was having absence seizures um for honestly as long as I can remember um not I, I don't know about like baby baby or toddler but like as soon as I was a teen and like I was definitely having absence seizures and so mine, I know they're all different. Mine were sort of like, I would be mid conversation, stop talking, have like a bit of a head twitch and come back. And they would range from like, you know, five seconds to 30 seconds. And, uh, they happened randomly, of course. And, it was obviously very embarrassing for a teenager to have no clue what's happening and just be made conversation and lose complete idea what, what I was saying. Uh, and, oh my God, it's like crazy to even think about right now, like the, the feeling, like you just can't explain it. And I can see your face understanding what I'm saying and it like makes me want to cry. Like it's crazy. So that happened and I have like very specific memories of like talking to boys I like and it happening or like doing a presentation at school and it happening or like one of the worst times I can remember I grew up a, a very competitive turned professional dancer and so I uh once it happened uh during a performance and that was uh really uh a shift for me it was you know I was just standing there on stage like no idea what I was doing music playing audience it was just horrible um and I forgot about it completely until I started reminiscing about this um so that was as long as I can remember and I remember my sister specifically always being like there's something going on like it's happening again like what was that uh going to my parents being like something is really wrong with Sarah like I'm telling you guys, it's serious. They're like, we've talked to her doctor. We've we've asked them, you know? Um, and I did go to my doctor a bunch um, in Canada and they they did all of the like physical neuro neurological testing. They were like, you're, you know, you're fine. Like all your testing adds up, like you're fine. Obviously you can't bring on an absence seizure. So it would never happen at the doctor's office. And uh, it wasn't until they, they were like, maybe it's your eyesight. Uh, we should get your eyes tested. I can see that probably happened to you too. <laughs> oh, carry on, carry on. <laughs> so shit. it was deflating every time. And I'd come home and we'd tell my sister. And my sister plays a massive role in my journey. Um, she just knew in her heart, like something isn't right. Uh, and so it wasn't until I was 15 and ironically enough, I, some, for some reason I went downstairs, she's my older sister. I went downstairs into my older sister's bedroom, laid down on her bed. It's just something I never did. Like, you know, older sister doesn't want to hang out with her little sister. Like it was just something I never did. But for some reason that day I went downstairs, she was getting ready to go out. I laid on her bed and I remember just being like, I'm so cold. Next thing I know, I am there. There's uh, the paramedics in the room, and I have had a grand mal seizure. And um, so that was when they were convinced okay, let's, you know, now we have to do an EEG, which I had never even heard of to know to ask for an EEG prior. Um, and so and no one in my family has epilepsy or anything that I know of. So, you know, no one really knew what was going on. So that I, I got my EEG and they were like, okay, you're epileptic. Um, never told me anything about what kind or anything like that. Just you're epileptic and uh, we're going to have to get you on medication. I wasn't giving, given options of medication. I was just put on medication 
I was told that this medication could or will, uh, the side effects will be weight gain and hair loss, two of which are things that when you're a teenager are the most fucking terrifying things you can imagine, let alone being a professional dancer and ballerina. I was like, uh, okay. So I'm going to, you know, I was so angry, so upset in denial, but I had to do what I had to do. Plus it was a medication that you had to take, um, at like 8 a.m. in the morning and 8 p.m. at night. So, you know, sleepovers and going out, like that just wasn't normal anymore. I would have to like set my alarm at a sleepover to like take my medication to go back to sleep. And then like, I was different and it was like very frustrating. And these are the things that pissed me off then. The things that pissed me off now are completely different. So I was on this medication that happened to those were that's what I was worried about. I wasn't aware that it was also a bipolar medication. And I am very lucky to not, you know, suffer those chemical imbalances in my brain. However, it created a chemical imbalance in my brain. And so from the ages of 15 to 18 is completely blank to me now. It's like I was like living in a fog. I remember being in the shower and pulling out clumps of hair and obviously gaining a ton of weight back then to me was just like, it wasn't, it wasn't body dysmorphia in the way that some people suffer with body dysmorphia. It was like, I know what's making me like this. And I hated myself. I hated the medical system. I hated epilepsy. I hated everything. I was so angry. But at the same time, I was so numb and I felt like I was just like floating through the world and I couldn't pick up, but I didn't know. I didn't know then. So I, I, I was training with Team Canada for the world championships and I couldn't pick up choreography anymore. Um, I, I would be like, I wasn't having the seizures, but I was feeling like it was like one constant, just fog. And I was, I was gaining weight. And so I didn't know my body the same way anymore. And when you're dancing, that's like very confusing. Uh, I couldn't pick up choreography. I remember so clearly having one of the teachers like clap their hands at me like this and be like, wake up. And I was just like, it was like nothing. Like I look at myself now then in like a bubble. Um, and it wasn't until I was about 22, 23, when I was for the first time ever explaining my story to someone that I realized, holy shit, that is why I don't remember that stage of my life because I was on bipolar medication and it m messed me up completely. It made me numb. Um, so that was, that was really hard. Uh, at that point. And then when I was 18, they were like, you know, you know, you grow out of epilepsy. And so because I was unable in my mind to dance anymore, and I still till this day tell everyone it was because of injuries, but realistically, it was because I just like, I sucked, like I couldn't dance anymore. I couldn't jump like I could, I couldn't turn, I couldn't, I couldn't remember choreography. Um, and so I it, it drove, that's kind of what drove me to, to acting uh in a way but when I was 18 they they were like hey so you, you usually grow out of epilepsy so we're gonna do another EEG so I did another EEG and I it came back normal so I was very excited and my family was very excited but at the same time uh I just like knew some I knew I hadn't like I was like that just doesn't feel right. That terrifies me. But at the same time, I don't care. I'm 18. You tell me I don't have epilepsy. I don't have to live like this anymore. Fuck yeah. So I went to school in New York. I went to acting school in New York. And I was not on medication for the first time since, you know, I was 15. And uh, it was great. It was fine. I was in a very intense program. So I couldn't leave much only for Thanksgiving and Christmas. Um, and for Thanksgiving, I went to go visit my boyfriend at the time who was on the West Coast. So there was a massive time change. 
And while I was there, I felt an absent seizure. And I instantly was like, holy shit, I know exactly what that was. I just had like a miniature seizure. Um, I was terrified because I didn't have medication. I thought I was going to have like a ground wall seizure. I still, till this day, don't know how it works, if those are warning signs or if they just, you know. So, and I couldn't come back to Canada to go to a doctor because I was in this very intense program in New York that I didn't want to miss. And I, you know, I couldn't miss. So I went to go see a specialist in New York when I got back and I explained to him my situation and he what it was the most comfort I had ever felt in a doctor's office in my life till this day. And he was like, okay, well, here's a list of, um, here's a list of medications you can choose. Here's the side effects. This is the one I think would be best for you. And I was like, don't you have to do all these tests? He was like, it sounds like, you know, exactly what happened. And I know that, you know, what happened. I can run these tests if it'll make you feel better but I'm going to be completely honest with you. I know exactly what happened and you're right. And this is what I think would be best. So he put me on medication that I am on till this day. And he is still my doctor and I've been seizure free for 10 years and I can stay on this medication through pregnancy. If I choose to do that, I can, I don't have side effects with this medication that I know of. I, Every time I, and I still will go to New York specifically to see him every few years, because if I can control one thing about this uncontrollable thing that I have, it's going to be how it's taken care of. And he, every time I go, like I go with my mom and he, I'm like so obsessed with this man and he like, doesn't get it. Like he doesn't understand why, like, he's like, you know, you can like go see a Canadian doctor. And by the way, they don't offer this medication in Canada. And so that I have to get it prescribed in the States. I have to go to the States to get it. Uh, it's, it's very difficult, but there's no uh, extended release version of the medication I'm on in Canada. And because like he told me, I ended up doing a 24 hour EEG and he told me most of my regular brain activity is at night. Um, uh, I, I can't have that dip in medication when it starts to wear off to when I take my next one. So I would never chance it. I'm like, no, I'm coming back here to see you. I love you. This is my, this is my medication. You're my guy. Like I'm keeping this up no matter what it, no matter what it is. Um, and I've, you know, since recommended someone to him and like, I, I would recommend anyone to him he's the best and he really like helped me get this version this this version of myself that I hated to become a version of myself that I love and appreciate and like care about now I love that um I love hearing that you found a doctor that is supportive and gave you those options and was clear because they are yeah. so unclear a lot of the time um yeah especially when you're younger and they don't tell you things directly they try to tell your parents or they give you big decisions maybe when you're too young to understand what you're deciding on or yeah. not like I don't know what medication you were put on but I was put on Valproic initially that's and exactly then... it I, when you were saying the hair thing, I was like, yeah, I got flashbacks when you said the hair thing. So I have a yeah. friend who recently uh, got diagnosed with epilepsy and she's much older than I am. And she is in severe denial and she's tried a bunch of medications and that was one of them. And she was like, you know, for lack of a better term, she was like, it made me dumb. I couldn't work. I couldn't think I was like spacing out on the simplest things that I've done my whole life. Um, and I was like, I know exactly what medication that is. You have to keep trying. She's like in denial that she even has it because it's, you know, it's such a journey to find medication. Yeah. It's, I don't know why that seems to be kind of the go-to medication. Cause I was on that in my, up till I was also 19. Then they switched me off Valproic. And in high school, that was like the worst. Well, I, I got on it when I was nine. 
So you know how you said from 15 to 18, you can't remember mine is nine to like 13, 14. Right. And then the rest is just, I was so slow in school. I failed so many classes. I skipped all the time. Same. So I was like, I can't focus Same. through this. And then it was just pinned as like, you know, you're unorganized or you like, kind of like you're dumb, but they don't you're know dumb. that you're on a medication that is. Just and you know, worst. what's so crazy is that feeling of your dumb carries on in such a traumatic way as you get older because you feel like everyone's against you all the time and thinks you're dumb it's so crazy and as I've gotten older I've realized like oh that was trauma oh, okay 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 mm -hmm. uh yeah, I'm sure that's what your session kind of unlocked for you because I was explaining yeah. my I don't talk about this with people because nobody asks nor do I want to talk about it mm -hmm. it's with people it's boring I mean it's boring to people who can't this is crazy that like I can talk to people who who get it that you're creating this community of people who need a community so badly like if I had this when I was 16 if my mom if my parents and my siblings had this it would have been completely different so that's how I feel too, because as we're filming the doc, like we film a lot of uh, like younger families, like kids and their parents and their parents are really involved. Like now there's purple day, you know how there's pink day. And like, yes, for I saw that. it's like, there's purple day now. That was not a thing growing up. Like if that was a thing, you know, just a lot of things where the parents are involved in like the epilepsy communities locally. Like my parents had zero clue about any of that stuff. Like there was no you know I didn't know until I saw it on your page I had no idea about purple day I, I didn't know until this year or last year maybe actually too yeah well I can't wait to celebrate purple day with you <laughs> next year <laughs> yeah yeah it was um I I don't know how how public have you been with your diagnosis because I for context on me like I no one in film knew I had it until this March was the first time that I came out publicly about it and it was the most terrifying thing ever but how has it been for you with acting and stuff so it's actually wild that you ask that because I didn't see it important now I know it's very important to tell people on set that you have epilepsy god forbid mm -hmm. because I do see it more as a responsibility now and I'm like I wear it as a badge of honor instead of you know being embarrassed of it but the first show that I did it was called burden of truth and in this show I had a seizure in character and I had tics it wasn't epilepsy it was some sort of poison from toxic waste and you know drama 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 but I had tics and ultimately the tics led to a grand mal seizure I don't understand who is controlling the universe, but that is insane for my first acting job, my first my first TV show to be a young girl who suffers from tics. Obviously I did my exact tic that, that I had because I, it was in my body. Mm -hmm. And then seeing myself on screen having the seizure was crazy. And so as I do, I made light of it. I was like, oh, great. I'm epileptic. I can do this with my eyes closed. This is perfect for me. I made jokes of it on set. It wasn't until promoting the TV show where I was like, wow, I actually found a lot of healing through playing this character and going through high school with this thing and being able to talk about it. High school, you know, fake high school. Um, and it was a very, very healing process doing that show. So I guess it was always kind of out there. And now I'm just kind of like, yep, I'm epileptic. That's that's who I am. I mean, the fact that you can say that or bring it up on set is really brave and good because I could, again, not till this much. Like I've been on sets, even sets I've directed, like bigger sets, uh, music videos where there are flashing lights and stuff. And I'm just sunglasses inside and people thinking yeah. that's a fashion statement um versus like oh I actually like shouldn't be here right now um yeah. so it's really cool that you're 
like upfront about it on sets and it is like a safety liability but for us it's really different because it's more personal than that um yeah and also there's a very intense you know stigma behind being a diva on set and you don't want to be the diva who is like I can't be in this scene actually there's flashing lights or I can't do this night shoot because if I don't sleep I can't work tomorrow um I can't do a last minute night shoot because I haven't adjusted my medication uh I I I had this one I, I was filming in New Zealand um and so that was a struggle um kind of adjusting my a sleeping schedule because lack of sleep is my number one cause um and so I had to adjust my sleeping schedule weeks leading up and my medication schedule weeks leading up I had to slowly change my when I took my medication because I was on a complete other time I was on a complete time change and so that was a struggle. And then another thing that happened to me while I was on set was um, they had kind of a last minute night shoot. It wasn't, we were supposed to wrap it around midnight um, or 11. And they were like, we're putting everyone on overtime. We're actually going to wrap it three. Sign off on this. Is everyone okay? And, you know, everyone's like, yeah, yeah. Overtime. Like, yeah, let's go. And I was like, I can't just sign that right away. I need to speak to someone. And they, and I was like, oh God, here it goes. Like, I'm going to be, I'm going to be the diva who like has to talk to a producer. Or like, so I went to a AD that I was pretty close with, um, pretty friendly with. And I was just like, listen, um, more than happy to stay here. Uh, but I don't have my medication. And if I don't take my medication, uh, at 11 or at least before midnight. I mean, I, I need, to, there's no, there's no, there's no question here. I need to take my medication and it, we were shooting far from where we were staying. So I was like, I need transport to go get it. I'm so sorry. I don't want to be this diva. And they were like, Oh my God, don't apologize. Uh, what's going to happen? Like walking. I was like, okay, I'm not going to like drop dead here. Okay. I'm telling you right now, like relax. It's okay. I just need someone to go grab my medication. I'll tell you exactly where it is. And bring it back to set and we'll be good no one has to speed no one's gonna die just you know so it's either like I'm embarrassed because it is a very for some reason epilepsy is a very embarrassing thing mm -hmm. um I feel like only epileptics can understand that it's super embarrassing for some reason especially when you have those abscess seizures um it's so weird and strange so, and it's like, it's embarrassing because people are like, oh God, she's sick. And I'm like, no, I'm mm, fine. I just, I'm fine. I'll be fine. You'll be fine too. Guess what? No one's going to be liable for anything here. I just need my meditation. Um, so yeah, they understood. They went and got it for me, but that was a big lesson for me in always be prepared no matter what. Um, as I've gotten older, you know, like if I'm going somewhere and I'm like, maybe I'll stay the night at my friend's place who live far away. I'm, and I'm, maybe I won't, I'm always taking my medication. It's like someone with a nut allergy doesn't leave their EpiPen behind. And my sister has a severe nut allergy. So I'm like, what am I doing? You know, it, like woke me up a little bit to like, you are liable for yourself. You have to be an advocate for yourself in every situation because the only person getting hurt is you and you've like suffered enough hurt and like silenced yourself enough to like be the person to stand up for yourself and advocate for like what you're going through because nobody else will mm -hmm. that was like a that massive lesson for me I'm learning that as you're saying it so it's very good advice um <laughs> <laughs> this is why it's important <laughs> I'm processing it now. I'm like, damn. Um, because that's the thing too. They think like, if you don't take your medication, you're just going to drop and have a seizure. Like I've also, this year's 10 years seizure free for me too. So I'm like, I can be on, like, it's going to stabilize me. I'm not going to like pass out and have a seizure if I don't have it this second, but like, I need to have it. But it's that little thing that other people don't think about, or even in the entertainment industry, it's not considered. 
Um, yeah. But like we, you know, everyone gets ready in the morning and our thought is like, I got to take my meds, I got to pack my meds. Like it's those little things that yeah. it's just that extra layer that we have to go through. And, and on film sets, like you said, the diva are feeling like you're a burden or even yeah. um, from like a director's perspective, when you're supposed to set the tone on set and kind of be like running the show. But then if you start to feel off or sick or, you know, meds or whatever, like I had a, an overnight shoot and I didn't say anything. I just was like, I'm going to stay quiet, which I, in retrospect, shouldn't have done. Um, yeah. So it's, it's, yeah, really inspiring to see that you were firm on it and like you need your medication. Um, mm -hmm. And people need to, if people knew more about epilepsy, they wouldn't start to get the mic and freak out because they yeah. know like, you know, it's just, you need it to be safe and it's like an EpiPen, like you said. It's, 100%. Yeah. If you have someone on set who's allergic to nuts, they're not going to have nuts at Crafty. Mm hmm Yeah. It's, and I've noticed they don't, nobody asks you when you're like signing on to do a project. They don't ask you, you know, I have, I always let them know my medical, like I also have pretty bad asthma. I have, you know, allergies. I have these things where I'm like, I'm letting you know now because in future, it's like, it's not okay to, to fuck it up. It's, it's not because mm -hmm. there's some there's someone's health at risk here um so yeah like I said advocating is so important and that's why when I saw you were doing this I was like how can I not be a part of this I'm so intensely passionate about it I've just never had anywhere to let it out mm -hmm. yeah no I mean when we when we heard I heard through Ariana um, that she had told us about you and I was like, oh my God, someone else in the entertainment industry that has it. Cause I, I when I think about it, I'm like, imagine probably how many more people have it, but don't say anything because of one, the stigma, but also the stigma in the entertainment industry. It's like, yeah. you never want to be the liability. You never want to lose a job because of that. Yeah. And cause people again, don't know what the full like encompassing thing of what epilepsy is. Yeah. Um, so when it hits your career, it's really, and, and an industry that's not made for, for this, like the lack of yeah. sleep is insane. Like that, yeah. 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 It's, but then it's like, you go, you do it anyways. Like I was a concert videographer, so I was filming right. till like 4am. <laughs> I was doing the opposite, you know, but you do it um, anyway, you, you do it anyway, but you just make sure people know, you know, you're like. And yeah, you make sure you take your meds and like you have the precautionary measures. I remember you, you're saying that. I remember my dad one time, he was so sweet. He sent me a list of actors in Hollywood who have epilepsy. This was years oh. ago. And yeah. I was just like, I think about it now. And I'm like, that's the sweetest thing ever. Like, he said, <laughs> like, that was a nod. Like, you can do it. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Yeah. yeah. It's, uh, yeah, it's interesting because it impacts like, so many parts of your life and from what I'm hearing with you it seemed like your upbringing like your te uh, childhood teenage yeah. years seemed to have or it seems where it had the most impact or do you find that it kind of flowed in as you got older into the adult years as well like has it does it still play I want to say it still play a part till now because it always does but how has it been in your adult years dealing with epilepsy and working your job and doing what you do and yeah well, it's interesting because it's kind of, it's changed. I mean, it's changed the way I make choices now. I think in a way, epilepsy can be looked at as a massive blessing. Uh, I am in an industry, like you said, people are up all night. People are doing drugs. People are experimenting with all these things and, you know, doing drugs to stay awake or partying, doing drugs. Like I never experimented like that because I knew I couldn't. And so in that way, it was a blessing. I mean, I can have fun without being inebriated because I can't be. And also it's much less fun ending up in a hospital bed. And I know how high the risk is of that. And I'm just like, you know, when people ask me like, oh, why don't you do, you know, I'm like, cause I'm the girl who ends up in the hospital. That's why, like, that's not fun for anybody. So in a way it's been, it's an interesting kind of vice actually to be like, oh no, I don't, 
partake in that because I have epilepsy and it's like people just get it right away they're like oh oh okay and it's like okay great now you're off my back carry on have your fun I can't I can't I won't uh so that's been sort of a, a moving forward as I've gotten older in an industry that can be very um focused or mm -hmm. drugs and alcohol is like very present in this industry um and so that's been a blessing in a way um and I guess you know I like I said it made me feel like I couldn't dance anymore which was the darkest time of my life then but it ultimately led me to acting and telling a story in a different way um and so that is also something that I don't know if it would have happened had I not been diagnosed with epilepsy um yeah I'm, I'm a little bit more cautious of a person which I, I like about myself I guess um yeah I feel like facing that type of adversity at such a at, at an age that is really Rough. important yeah facing that adversity in as a teenager it, it kind of braced me for what's to come in this industry and in life Mm -hmm. um I think it made me a little bit more resilient to some trials and tribulations I would have moving forward I think I know worst case scenario and so I'm less afraid of minor things going wrong um but that's not to say that when I was going through it it was the worst thing that could happen to me and I thought the world was like fully against me and it was really really hard to be a young teenager going through that and I wish so badly I could have this version of myself tell that version of myself that more people go through it and you know you're gonna be okay and I just wish I had this I really do I wish I didn't have anything I had no idea what I was doing I felt like I was the only one that was different out of every normal teenager and why me you know but now I'm I'm grateful in a way I see it as a blessing and I had to change the narrative which allows me to continue to change narratives with negative situations in my life mm -hmm. Ch uh, changing the narrative is a really good way to put it I think that really sums it up well um yeah. especially because I um it's very similar because I got into film when I was 13. I was, uh, my sport, you know, you said dancing was yours and you couldn't. Mine was swimming and I couldn't anymore. So then I found film when I was like 13-ish, 14 kind of wow. thing. And it was, um, fuck, uh, do you have memory issues or is that, <laughs> is just I think, memory? I mean, I, I mean, yeah, I guess so. Like, I don't remember majority of my... No, because I was I was on a train of thought and it oh, I do that all the time. my mind. Yeah, it's uh, a lot of people with epilepsy, like even people I've been interviewing, uh, will be through an interview and then half will just pause and be like, "What were we talking about?" And it, it's actually doctors have, that we've spoken to have talked about it: epilepsy and memory. What do you mind if I ask? What medication you're on now? Uh yes, I am on <laughs> lamotrigin. Lamotrigine. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I was like, maybe it's our medication. I don't know. I'm on like the Kepra um, Levit Levitromycin or whatever it's called. Mm. The extended release. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. Because I, I forgot what point I was getting to, but something about changing the narrative and how, yeah, how important that is. Um, because one thing too, I was going to say, it's such an invisible uh, condition like that's what yeah. it's really known as because if you look at us you can't anymore that blood see yeah. most of the time you you can't tell what anyone's going through um yeah. so uh, especially that whole saying of like you don't know what people are going through behind closed doors I think epilepsy is the perfect definition of that 
Um, did you, do you find that epilepsy is not taken as seriously because of that? Because it's not let per se a physical, like it's invisible in a lot of ways. Yeah, I, I think, I think so. I think, I think people who don't suffer with it, why would they think about it or care about it? You know, obviously I know why, and you know why, but for people who don't, deal with it or have someone they love that deals with it I mean why would that be a the first thought that comes to their mind like oh maybe they're epileptic uh what that must be hard you know I think it's like I think another thing is people people I think will just be like oh yeah like that that guy that guy had a seizure and like blah 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 and then I'm like you know if I bring up that I'm epileptic like oh I'm 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 sorry I'm like, why? This is not a sin to talk about it. Like, uh, it's an interesting thing. Like, if I have asthma too. If I said, you know, they were like, this person had asthma, I'm like, oh God, that sucks. Like, I have asthma. Like, that, I know what that's like. They wouldn't be like, oh, oh I'm so sorry. They'd be like, oh shit, that's, you have asthma? I didn't know. But when it's like something like epilepsy, it's like really taken as like, if they get scared people are like are you gonna have a seizure right now and I think that might be why a lot of epileptics don't like to talk about it because it puts you in a box that people are like afraid of like mm -hmm. I don't think people think it's like contagious I just think that people are like oh my god this person's a liability I must be with someone else when I'm with them or I don't want to deal with it kind of thing yeah and the I like visually seizure if they were to have seen it whether it was like youtube or in a film or whatever it's a very graphic thing it's it's not yeah. easy to I, I personally can't even i haven't even seen one like i can't get through a few seconds of that but um those kind of people like i think that's what they they think epilepsy and they just visualize a seizure right away and that's yeah. you know so that's what can be scary and they start to worry and it's like it's so much more than a seizure like it's it's way more than that but their their mind just goes to the most you know graphic thing and that's why in the doc we actually have no nothing about seizures there's not one video of a seizure in the doc yeah. like zero because well, it's very hard for epileptics and families of epileptics to watch I mean my sister saw me have my seizure she scarred for life because of it you know mm -hmm. um but that is true you know it's people think seizure but it's like <laughs> this is a lifestyle you know like it is a complete lifestyle and my, you know my partner now like he gets it you know he's like he had to learn about it and he still doesn't even, I mean he'll probably listen to this or watch this and be like I didn't know any of that like because I'm like I didn't know any of it I was explaining to him my my beginning of my story and in through explaining it I realized like oh I'm like traumatized from that oh I was like unaware of my whole adolescents cool 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 okay I should go to therapy for that <laughs> yeah because <laughs> you don't realize it's traumatic until like years later because it's it's kind of like survival mode you're just going through it um and then it hits you randomly like that's what happened to me last month it just or in May I was just like oh this is actually trauma I had no clue I just thought diagnosed yeah. you go through it it sucks and then you're stable. It still kind of sucks, but like you get through it, you know, you just don't think about the repercussions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Crazy. Mm -hmm. Um, but we were also talking before, uh, when Tally was on, I, I like what you're saying about, cause we, we've been pretty vocal about how the film has been rejected by local grants, uh, for funding support because they don't see epilepsy as urgent or a trendy topic to even consider funding or supporting. Um, what are your thoughts on, on that in terms of just having more like epilepsy centric media that actually humanizes us and doesn't, you know, show us yeah. in bad ways? Well, I was watching your, one of your clips and you said, they're telling you in the industry that epilepsy is not an urgent story to tell and it brought me instantly back to sitting in the doctor's chair and them not being urgent about what was going on with me and back then like I felt like it was a visceral reaction I was like 
I didn't think I've never heard anything like this. I haven't heard people talk about it. And so I never thought about what it would feel like to hear someone say epilepsy is not an urgent story to tell, because as much as people it's like invisible, like you said, it's not that people are like, you don't hear people be like epilepsy doesn't matter. You don't hear that. But when you do and you have it, you're like, excuse me, this mm -hmm. isn't every day for me. You don't get that because you don't struggle with it. But like, you don't know what it feels like to like not be able to like as as little as it seems like when I was younger, like I can't talk to my crush because like I could have an absence seizure, but like you don't care about that. I can't go to the club with my friends because I can't drink as much as them. You know, I can't be in the flashing lights. Like you don't know what that feels like. Uh, there, it's, it's, it's so, it's so aggravating to hear that because I'm sure anybody who says that has never dealt with it or knows anybody who's dealing with it. That's why this film is so important because I've never personally spoken to, I've probably spoken to like five epileptics in my life. And even then they don't get into their story or the trauma of it because it's depressing. I mean, nobody wants to. Mm -hmm. If it wasn't for this interview, I would I wouldn't have I don't know if I ever I don't know if I would have ever talked about it like this. Yeah. It's a uh... It, I think because of how it's uh, portrayed in society and everything, it's compared to other medical, um, yeah. other medical things. It's one of the ones that's really overlooked. So I think it almost makes us who have it overlook it in some ways because that's just how society <laughs> does. Um, mm -hmm. Like we, we were talking to someone, uh, one of the epilepsy, someone who's going to speak in the doc, and she was saying like, when you hear the word cancer everyone knows about cancer. Everyone knows what, or like when you get diagnosed with cancer, they give you all the information because she had cancer and also epilepsy. So she's like, they gave me a whole thing. This, 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 this is what to expect. When she got diagnosed with epilepsy, nothing. Like it was very confusing and this and that. So it goes to show that like, I can understand looking back up if you know why I brush things off or how you were saying, because it's like, that's mm -hmm. the environment. The doctors didn't even care to <laughs> provide accurate info. It's like, it's given me yeah. like severe trust issues with doctors, with the medical system. Like I have asthma. I've had asthma since I was a little kid. And like, you know that I had every inhaler. I had, ev I, I knew everything about it. I got to stay home from school or I had to, I don't remember. I was so young, but like, I got like multiple weeks off of school because I had had an asthma attack. Like when I was diagnosed with epilepsy, there was no missing school. There was no understanding. It was like, it was like, it was seen as like a choice when in my mind, epilepsy is in my own, this is not about anybody else's condition. In my own mind, my epilepsy is more urgent than my asthma in my mm -hmm. own medical history, not speaking on anybody else's. But when I think about it, I'm like, I have a rescue inhaler. Whereas I don't know, and I can feel it coming on. And a lot of people can feel seizures coming on. I, I never have. I never, I don't know when it's going to happen. And another thing is like being 16 and like not being able to get your license when all your friends are driving. That was horrible. And, mm -hmm. and, and get, getting your learner's permit taken away. And I remember being like, oh, I just don't want my license. I'm going to move to New York. I don't need a car. Like, why couldn't I just be like, they took it away because I have epilepsy but like, I didn't even have the kind of epilepsy where like, I, I don't know. It's just, it's, it's, we don't know enough about it. Nobody knows enough about it. I don't know enough about it. Same. I, I didn't know until like March when we started interviewing and meeting doctors and stuff, there were so many things that I was like, how did no one tell me about yeah. this? Like, how did I not know about this? I, when I, when I go to my doctor, I overload him with questions because I'm like, I don't know. It's not even on the internet. Like I can't even find it on the internet. Like I can't even like all we, I have, you know, anxiety, right? When my form of anxiety will sometimes come out in like a physical way and, and I'll get like body shakes and I'll like get like mm -hmm. 
that kind of anxiety, if I'm having like an anxiety attack or whatever it is. Um, but on top of that, now my anxiety, whatever that is, is now like, oh my God, I'm going to have a seizure. And then I'm like, is that making it worse? That's not even how seizures happen. Or is it? I don't know. Like it's, mm -hmm. it's constant. Just like, I don't know what's going to bring on a seizure. All I know is that I need to take my medication and I need to sleep. The, am I going to have a seizure is such, when you said that, I was like, that's where my mind goes a lot of the time with anxiety too. Even if you're stable, I've been stable 10 years and that thought yeah. will still come into my mind. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes I'll be like reading and like, I have glasses. I won't be wearing my glasses. Sometimes I'll be reading and I'll feel like my eyes get like unfocused or like fuzzy. And I'll be like, Oh my God. Like my heart will start pounding. I'll be like, it's, it's, it's the worst. It's literally, it's the worst. Never knowing. It's like, you know, and I can, my sister has a very severe tree nut allergy where it's like, everyone is usually allergic to peanuts. Whereas like, she's actually not that allergic to peanuts. She's allergic to tree nuts. And I remember her growing up being like, no, oh, there's nuts in that. And everyone being like, almost like annoyed that like they have to cook a certain way or like they have to read mm -hmm. the ingredients. And like, in a way, it's so nice to have someone understand even a little bit what it's like to feel like a burden. And that takes me back to like set where it's like, sorry, guys, like I, there can't be, I mean, if there's strobe lights in the scene, I can't be in it or take out the strobe lights. I don't know, add them and fix it in post. I don't know. Like you don't want to feel like a burden, but that's just the way it goes sometimes, I guess. It shouldn't be a burden. It's not a burden. I didn't choose this. Yeah. Yeah. And it can feel like a burden. That's the part that sucks. But I think like the more we share stories like you're doing now and, you know, as things go, hopefully there'll be more better mandates on film sets and that will be considered yeah. more, especially with technology and the way it's going, like flashing lights can be added in post. I'm seeing how things are going. It's something that could actually, if it were to, you know, be the case, because um, I mean, the way yeah. things are going, they won't even need us anymore. So I, yeah, I mean, hopefully not, but that's a whole but, like, other that's what I mean. <laughs> that's, well, yeah. Um, but that's, that's what I mean of like, there are ways it's just excuses sometimes with that stuff. Um, I don't know if you have it with flash photography too, but on, uh, I've had that on set. So taking a crew photo and photographer used flash and I didn't have a warning of that. Not that anyone knew, no one knew, I guess. And I was like, um and I just went like holy shit like I was like ow like holy shit and everyone just kind of looked at me confused like what and I was like can we just the next one be without flash whether even if I was open about it it's like they don't think those little things could actually still hurt your eyes like even though it's just one flash like it, yeah and also we don't know you know oftentimes I've been like I guess I'm like, well, I've been in strobe lights, so I guess that's not the kind of epilepsy. I guess strobe lights don't bring it on. And when they do EGs, they do do the lights and they're like, they're like you, that doesn't, for me specific, they're like, that doesn't affect your brain waves, but it's still, I'll see a strobing light and I'll be like, I have to, I'll, I'll cover my eyes. I'll do this. Like, you know, I, I have friends now and my partner, like he'll, he'll do it too. Like it's, it's so nice too having someone do that for you care that much to be like, Oh my God, like, are you okay? I'm like, Oh yeah, I'm, <laughs> I think I'm just going to leave now. <laughs> um, but yeah, my friend did a play and there was um, flashing lights and they were like, come to my play, come to my play. And they're the sweetest. And they were like, oh, no, wait, you're epileptic. There's flashing lights. Don't come to my play. <laughs> and I'm like, that's such a bummer. Like, I really want to come. And they're like, I'm, I am I shouldn't have this. I'm an idiot. Uh, you know, like, at least they cared enough to say it and remembered that I was epileptic. Like, that meant so much more to me mm -hmm. that they said it's something I don't know. It's just like those little things when people care or remember or ask if you're okay when there's flashing lights or like, you know, like my friend had this play where there was strobe lights and they were like, don't come actually. That means so much. And people don't really, I get, I think maybe people are also afraid to do that because 
they're like, I don't want to make you feel different or like, you know, like how do yeah. I win here? Um, and it is, I guess, a tough balance. I mean, we have that with other things like, uh, you know, you don't want to make people feel different, but you also want to make them feel seen and heard and like you care. So I guess it is. That's what I mean. I can't wait to watch this documentary so I can better know how to tell people about it or even yeah how to deal with it I guess yeah yeah that's that's why um I mean like what you're saying about your friends it's that form of community that you yeah. when you first get diagnosed it's so lonely like you feel really lonely with it that when you have that with friends or family or whatever you feel less lonely like Mm -hmm. whether it's not them understanding fully but the fact that there's that consideration is really important yeah I guess to sum up and I'm sure more things will come out of this but for anyone who has epilepsy um that wants to get into a job in the entertainment industry um just any kind of creative work but might feel like that's holding them back or feel embarrassed about it um do you have any advice that you would give to someone like that um, I think, I think my advice would be, you know, like I said before, take it, take it seriously. It's super easy to want to get caught up in the lifestyle of the entertainment industry, but you are made different. That's just the way it is. You have this condition, wear it with a badge of honor and like advocate for yourself it's so important to do that. It's not going to go away if you ignore it. So own it and come prepared. And ultimately, I guess what I would say is do things like this. Talk about it. Like get it out there. I didn't, I wouldn't know it's hard to give advice to someone when about this when I've never gotten it, but I guess, you know, it doesn't, it make like I said, change the narrative. Like it doesn't make you, it does make you different, but not in a bad way. I mean, my mom always used to say to me when I was younger, she's like, you just, you just have a special brain. I always knew you had a very special brain and maybe this is just, part of it and it's such a fairy tale way to look at it but that's how I look at life is in a fairy tale way you know like when I'm in the water I am a mermaid when I'm on set no matter what I'm doing I am the lead no matter what role I no matter what number yeah. I am on the call sheet it's my movie it's my show I'm the lead in my own head I'm professional you know um yeah so just like own it and like change your narrative make it a blessing and share it with people that you love and like let them in because they probably want to be let in and that's something that I learned later on and through this process is people do care and we have to give them the opportunity to learn and if we're embarrassed of it and we keep it closed and we don't share it, then how can we expect others to care and to advocate and to, you know, I don't want, you don't want people to be worried about you, but you want people to check in on you. And I think check in on people who need to be checked in on no matter what they're going through. Yeah. Wear it with a badge of honor. It's not going to go away. And if it does, I'm so happy for you, but double check. <laughs> I appreciate what you're doing so much. I have been dreaming of something like this coming to fruition. Maybe it's been manifested by epileptics everywhere, honestly, because there's nothing like it. And anybody who tells you that this isn't important, send them to me. I have <laughs> something to say to them. This is a very important story. And Every, every epileptic everywhere deserves this because we've been through a lot. Yeah, especially the, the kids and the parents and the families. I mean, yeah, we've been, we deserve this.